Okay. Just a little promo first up of this book called The Pilgrim Church by H. Broadbent. Who's got that book at home on yourself? Have you read it? And you've got it at home. Yours is already in circulation, Marion. Anyone else got it? Have you read it? Yep. So this, this one is, I bought this for Shiloh because I've asked the, the current class of disciples to read this book over the next season. And so uh, who would who'd like to have this one to start reading? Who's got Diane? It's a wonderful book. It's a classic. It's written a few decades ago. The author has passed away. And apparently a lot of the documents and books he had access to have disappeared as well. But he brings a very different history of the church from the beginning to now or the early, early last century, in fact, not, not up to, right up to now. So it's sort of compulsory reading for serious disciples to understand the history of the church, where we fell away from being apostolic, and, but there was always a remnant right through history. Hallelujah. And we're part of that remnant in these last days. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So this session is called... I have opened a door. I have opened a door. They're the words of Jesus in Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. Jesus said, I've opened a door. But to, uh, to read this in context, and let us um, begin, begin the letter to the church at Philadelphia in chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 7. And Father, we ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to be granted to each one of us here today and those who are here on the video uh, this, this teaching session of coming out of the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 8, that you said, Lord Jesus, that you've set before us an open door. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So in chapter, Revelation chapter 3 verse 7 and to the angel messenger of the church in Philadelphia write I really want to exhort you to get used to at least saying angel messenger if you've got the spirit filled life bible it has a little one there beside angel and in the margin it says messenger the Greek word is angelos but it, it doesn't literally mean angel it literally means messenger so a messenger can be a heavenly messenger which we call angel or it can be a human messenger. And there's no other scriptural, there's no scriptural basis for calling the messenger of the churches in, in Revelation an angel because God did not appoint angels to lead churches on the earth or even to bring the message to them. Who did he appoint? He appointed men. And in the context of the New Testament he appointed apostles to bring the word of God. So I encourage you to consider that carefully and so we at least say to the angel messenger who in this case would have been probably an apostle to the church in Philadelphia write these things says he who is holy he who is true so this letter is from Jesus but in this letter he identifies himself as he who is holy so the first thing about Jesus is, who wrote the letter, is that he is holy. What does that mean? He is holy. He is totally different. He's totally unstained by any worldly thought or deed. Or thought, word or deed. He's, he's holy. He's separate. He's totally separate. He is different. He is... Um, set apart he has set himself apart he calls us to be holy and secondly he is true Jesus is true and he gives us the spirit of truth that we may know him he gives us the word of God that we may know the truth so Jesus is true and, he, and the truth is his word John 17:17. 17, 17. the truth is his word Amen so we're receiving a letter from, from Jesus who is 1717 who is holy and he is true 
And then he identifies himself in a third way. He identifies himself as he who has the key of David. So Jesus, next line, Jesus has the key of David. Jesus has the key of David. And because he has the key of David, he, he's the one who opens, and when he opens, no one shuts. And when he shuts, no one opens. So the key of David is a key of supreme authority. Amen? You can put that in. The key of David is, is the key of supreme authority. So straight away you're probably thinking of Matthew 28 verse 18 when Jesus said to the, the apostles and disciples all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So Matthew 28, 18, Jesus is saying there that he has received the key of David. He has the authority to shut and nobody opens. He has the authority to open and no one shuts. Now, before we go on into the letter, let us understand more about this key of David and about the one who holds the key of David. So we go to Isaiah chapter 22 and the passage is from verse 15 uh, to 24. So it's Isaiah chapter 22 and we're looking at the passage concerning Shebna and Eliakim, 25 actually, the full passage is, 15 to 25. And it's concerning Shebna and Eliakim. Concerning Shebna and Eliakim. It says that Shebna is the steward who is over the house. Which house? The house of king, of the king of his time, who was um, uh, Hezekiah, and over the whole household of the king, which included the whole kingdom of Judah. So it's like he's the second most important man yeah. in the kingdom of Judah. He's a steward. So in, in a sense the modern word bishop largely means a steward. So he's like unto a bishop. A bishop is an appointment of man, not an appointment of God. And so it, it, it's a worthy office, but it's an appointment by man. And so Shebna has been appointed by the king to be this steward, like unto a bishop. And God in verse 16 then challenges Shebna about what he's doing. And he actually says, what you've been doing, Shebna, is like unto a, a sepulchre, a tomb. You're trying to build a name for yourself so people remember you when you die, and so your works are really just like you're building your own tomb. Okay? And in verse 17, God says because of that, he will, he will throw this man away. He will dismiss him from office. Verse 18 says he'll, he'll do it quite violently in fact. The dismissal will be quite violent. And this man will become a shame to his master's house and this man will die in a different country, in a far country. So in other words, he, he, won't, he won't get to even enjoy in his death the sepulchre he built for himself because he's going to die in shame. Uh, and so verse 19, I'll drive you out of your office and from your position he will pull, will pull you down or you will be pulled down or God will pull you down. So God's, God's dealing with this man who's been given an appointment to high office and who has, uh, what's the word, behaved wrongly at least. He's discredited that office. He's used his office to try and build something for his own name. He's forgotten that he's actually there to serve the king. Amen? And so many, quote, bishops of the church make that mistake. They end up trying to build something themselves rather than honouring the head of the church, Jesus, whom they're meant to be serving as stewards and as overseers in his house. So the first five verses are very negative where God is dealing with this man Shebna who's as a steward, a bishop, over the household of God and he's now been dismissed and actually he's going to be killed. Verse 20, now we come to the good news. God says, then it will be, shall be in that day that I'll call my servant Eliakim, 
the son of Hilkiah. So in the first part of verse 20 we learn that the, that the calling to, to God's office is a calling from God. It's not an appointment of man. So the first thing we, hear, we find out that God's now going to call a man called Eliakim. And Eliakim means um, God of raising or God raised. So this man is going to be someone who's been raised by God. He's not going to be someone who went to Bible college or seminary, someone who worked their way up the ranks of the, of the church organisation or whatever it is, but he's actually going to be a man called by God. And, and, and not only called by God, but he's already been prepared by God because his name means raised by God or God of raising. The E-L in many Hebrew words means God. So you, when you see E-L on a name or a place, look it up because it will tell you something about God. For example, Bethel, a very common one, means house of God. So if you're involved with Bethel, you're involved with God's house. You're talking about the house of God. And this man, Eliakim, is also designated as the son of Hilkiah. And this is another prophetic name. His father's name has A-H on the end, which refers to Jehovah or Yahweh. So when you see that A-H, you can also know that this is another, there's a deep understanding here of the revelation of Yahweh in this name. And so this name means um, Yahweh's portion or the portion of Yahweh. So this man that God's going to call and raise up is already, in a sense, God's portion, God's provision. So God has provided apostles for his church. When he raised up on high, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Ephesians 4, 7, 4, 8 says that. And then verse 11 it says he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. So Jesus gave those ministries, and some people call them offices, to the church for the building up of the church, for the bringing of the saints to perfection until the church is functioning properly as a mature body in the earth. Amen? Amen. So coming into apostolic alignment, being joined together to function as that mature body. Hallelujah. So the first thing we learn is that God will choose a man, call him, He'll be God's choice and he'll be God's, God's portion and he'll be God raised. Hallelujah. And uh, for example, if you look at the Apostle Paul in the Bible, he's a man like Eliakim. He was, he was, God had raised him to be a good Pharisee because he knew that if he raised him to be a good Pharisee, he'd become a good Christian preacher then because he'd know the law of Moses thoroughly and once he gets the revelation of Jesus and receives the Holy Spirit, he'll become a great preacher and apostle. So Paul was, in a sense, raised out of obscurity to become a leading apostle in the church of Jesus Christ because God told him at his baptism through the disciple Ananias that, that he was a chosen vessel of God's. Amen? He'd been, he was God's portion. Amen. And now God is going to call him and raise him to a place of prominent ministry in the first century church. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? Amen. And so maybe some of us even have a testimony or are, or are realising that God's got a call on our life, that he's, that he's predetermined that call. So we're, 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 we're the son of Hilkiah because Yahweh has, has already chosen us to be his and now we're, we're a brother or sister of of. Uh, Eliakim, because God is now raising us, amen, into that place where he wants us to fulfil the call. Hallelujah. Now verse 21 tells us more about Eliakim. And there's four points in this verse. Number one, he said, I'll clothe this man Eliakim with your robe. The robe, the robe of office which Shebna had worn is now going to be placed on the servant that God is raising, the one of God's choice. And so in the terms of our understanding today, it's from the bishop to the apostle. The bishop carried God's authority, yes. But, but, God, but it's not, that was not the right place for it to be. So God's going to take that robe and place it on the apostle, the one he's raising, the one he's appointing. Secondly, he's going to strengthen this one with the belt. So Shebna even wore that belt. 
It was meant to be a belt of truth. It was meant to be a, a, a belt that, in a sense, sealed that man in that office to be faithful to the word concerning that office, but he'd not been faithful. So God takes the belt off him and puts it on the one he's raising. Amen? Can you see it? Yeah. And of course, what's the belt of truth? Again, it's the word of God. It's being faithful to the commandments that Jesus gave us. Thirdly, he says, I'll commit your responsibility into his hand. So here's a, a transference of responsibility. And with responsibility comes the authority and the ability to minister, to do the work. So commit to you into your hand. The right hand is, represents the place of authority. But the hand, and if you're right-handed particularly, that's the hand you work with. Amen? Hallelujah. That's the hand you write with. That's the hand you... It, it's it's your, the ability is put into your hand now to do the work you're called to do. So in a sense, it's, it's, a, it's a type of ordination that's happening here. Because when a person is ordained, a robe is put on them, a belt is put on them, and responsibility is put into their hand. And with the responsibility goes the ability or the gifting to, full, to do that work. Amen? But the thing that, that is different with the one that God is raising, the apostolic leader, the fourth point in verse verse 21 is that I'll then make him to be a father. The Shebna, the steward, had not been a father. And bishops around the world today are not fathers. They are like big chiefs, administrators, wearing a robe of office. And, um, but when that robe is put on an apostle, it doesn't bring him into that office of the bishop so much, but brings him into the true office of the chief shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he becomes a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, in other words, to God's people, and to the whole house of Judah, to all of God's people. The apostle is as a father. He shall be a father. So that's very powerful, isn't it? So we see in this fourth point, the restoration of the house is, is, is going even further than where it was ever, ever was with Shebna, because now God is raising a father in the house. Because in the house of God there's meant to be true family relationships that a true father has with his children. Amen? So a father is to be trusted. A father is to be reliable. A father is to be loyal and true. And a father is to practice justice properly. Amen? And show mercy. All of these things. Hallelujah. So God is restoring his house. He's restoring fathers in these last days. And the last prophetic word of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, uh, illustrates this very powerfully, that God said, Before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, I'll send the prophet Elijah. And when he comes, he will restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. And God warns us that if this doesn't happen, the earth will be struck with a curse. Because God wants proper family relationships restored. Amen? Sometimes we make the mistake of fighting for family relationships that are not righteous. Where, where there's not a heart to serve God and, and to be righteous. But God wants to restore righteous family relationships where fathers are true fathers, faithful and loyal, giving good leadership and providing a safe place for, the, for their wife and for the children. They transfer that into the house of God. God wants to bring us out of the hands of administrators, bureaucrats, bishops, people who have taken office by the appointment of man and raise up fathers, amen, who actually love the children, who love the sons, who love the house of God and are building, letting God build his house through us. Hallelujah. So what will be the result of that? Well, even more importantly now, in verse 22, here's in a sense the most important point. God says, the key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder. This is the only other specific mention of the key of David. And, and in the book of Revelation we see that Jesus has the key of David. So this is a very messianic teaching here, showing us Messiah, but also showing us the the style or the, the type of apostolic leadership that God will provide for his church. Hallelujah. 
So the key of the house of David I'll lay on his shoulder. So what's the shoulder represent? What's another reference to the shoulder? Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. That child who will be born, that son will be given and upon his shoulder will be the government of the kingdom of God. Amen? And that government will grow and increase upon the shoulder. So God's going to put onto the shoulder of this apostolic leader the government. Amen? And of course that's firstly and always Jesus the Messiah. He carries that, fulfills that prophecy out of Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 that he will, on his shoulder will be the government. And that government of God's kingdom will grow and increase in the earth. Hallelujah. And it's signified by judgment, justice and peace. Hallelujah. And so then the key is explained exactly as it is in Revelation. He shall open and no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall open. When God appoints someone into the ministry and especially into the apostolic ministry, there's tremendous authority given to that apostolic leader, to the apostle. It's the authority of Christ. Of course, if that apostle runs amok, or is not properly trained, and runs in the office before their time, then lots of problems happen. Then verse um, 23 and 24 show us that, that through God raising his, his chosen one, his portion, and calling that one and pointing them into office, this opens the door to the glory. Now when the apostles are in place, if we come back to this little diagram of apostolic alignment, sorry that it's not done clearly, but here's the messenger, the evangelist, calling people to come to the door, which is the Lamb of God, the cross, amen? Here's the pastor washing with, with, with baptism and the water of the word, the, the new believers, to bring them into the spirit-filled life. And so here's the, the, the prophet and the teacher and finally the apostle all ministering into the life of the church to bring everybody into functional maturity. Hallelujah. So it's almost like the apostle, in a sense, ushers the church then to this final doorway to come into the glory. And this is illustrated here for us in Isaiah chapter 22. Verse 23 says, Speaking of this one who has the key of David, I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place, and he shall become a glorious throne to his father's house. It's such a clear reference to Jesus in many ways, but God is bringing setting the apostle, who is actually a type of Jesus Christ or representative of Jesus Christ, who is on this throne. Amen? And so the apostle comes with a word that releases the church to come into that placement with God, into that tabernacle with God. Isn't that awesome? Where we're covered by the wings of the cherubim, the blood of atonement's upon the mercy seat, so we commune with God. We dwell with God. Hallelujah? And so, once, once that apostle is in place, the full order of the church is being restored, then we start to realise who we are. We are the dwelling place of God, individually and corporately as we're joined together. Because while we all have an individual experience of God, we can only have that experience in the context of being baptised into his body. We're one of many, amen? amen. Members of the body. So it's a corporate experience that's experienced individually. Isn't that wonderful? And so there's no mediator. When I put the apostle here, it's not as a mediator. It's as a minister equipping the church to be able to come through. Are we together? And when we come through, there's no apostles in here. Do you notice that? We're all sons. The ministry finishes here. The work of the ministries is finished at this doorway. You got it? When the church is able to enter in here, we're all saints, we're all sons. No longer any leaders, only Jesus. Amen? Can you see that? That's the goal. That's the glorious house. So when the, when the true apostles in place and, and, and functions in ministry, which is the ministry of prayer here at the altar of incense and the word to the church, then the church is able to enter in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And, and this one becomes a glorious throne. So it's, it's a messianic reference again to Jesus is sitting on the throne and God's glory is released. Verse 24, 
tells us that they will hang on him all the glory of his father's house. All of the glory of God is revealed in the face of Jesus the Messiah. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6. Thank you. So even the cups and the pitchers, the jugs, will all be glorious. So the cups and the pitchers say, will leave me for this. It's all vessels. Remember Timothy talks about, Paul talks to Timothy about vessels of honour. So we're the vessels, amen? And we'll all be filled with the glory. When we come into apostolic alignment and we've been joined and we're functioning, then we start to experience the glory. Hallelujah. In verse 25, I, I can't say I fully understand it because God says, in that day, the peg that is fastened in a secure place will be removed and be cut down and fall and the burden that was on it will be cut off for Yahweh has spoken. So I don't have much to say about that verse. I'm sure God will give us the understanding of it in due time. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 3 now and, and come to our specific word for today. Because the word for today is actually a Rima word to us as an apostolic people, as an apostolic company. And what is that word? It's, it's verse 8. So you might like to read with me. Jesus says to the church, to us, I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. I don't know when it was, but some years ago God quickened that word to my understanding and I knew it was a word for me and for us. I don't know how much I spoke about it at the time and then I let it drop. Driving home from Dorigo, New South Wales just a couple of weeks ago now, we had a wonderful visit, met a, met a new sister in Glen Innes and then had wonderful fellowship with eight, eight souls all together in, in the Dorigo Fellowship. Driving home, God quickened to me this word again. Revelation 3 verse 8. I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word and have not denied my name. Hallelujah. This is the word to us. So I'm bringing it publicly with great emphasis and even releasing it into the nations. Anyone who sees this video, into the regional house churches, this is your word, because this is our word. God says to us as a people and to us individually, see, I've set before you an open door. You know, for me, I don't, I don't see an individual call on my life anymore. I'm just part of Shiloh. For me, Shiloh is what God is raising up, not Paul Galligan or anyone else, but Shiloh. So you may not be thinking quite the same way as me yet, but I, I don't think individually so much as, you know, who is Paul Galligan? Well, he's part of Shiloh. And God has given a word to Shiloh that he's set an open door before us. Amen. And nobody can shut that door. Hallelujah. People as recently as two days ago tried to shut that door at us. You know, we had a person here making big proclamations against us, etc. So we, we often have threats, even very, very threatening threats, other times we have sneaky words being said behind our backs or even to our face that are trying to discourage us, They're trying to cut us off, put us off track. And, um, but nothing can stop us because Jesus says, I've, see, I've set an open door before you. So let's look at verse 8. First of all, he says, I know your works. So what is our work? A lot of those works can be done in secret. But Jesus knows them. Individually, you know, you may have... In fact, every time you tithe, you're doing a secret work. But God sees. Every time you give something extra for, some, for something God's put on your heart or you just make a special offering, God sees. What else do we do for Jesus? And any time we speak for Jesus... Any time we even correct ourselves and say, stop behaving like that, Paul. That's not becoming of you any longer. Any time you or I just stop ourselves and say, stop behaving like that, talking to ourselves, and we repent on the spot and ask Jesus, it's a, sec it's a secret work. Mm. But Jesus says, I see that. I see you correcting your bad response. 
I see you apologising to that person that you upset. I see your works. Jesus sees everything, folks. Unfortunately, he sees the works that aren't so good as well. He sees the times we don't pull ourselves up. We don't apologise, whatever. And we allow a little rift to come. And what else are the works he sees? He sees what we do for others. Amen? Every time you go out of your way for someone, give them a call, send a text, go visit, offer to pick them up, whatever it is. Jesus sees it. Amen? Amen. The way we treat people. You know, sometimes some challenging people come in into Shiloh. A little person came in here just yesterday. I was just sitting downstairs with Murray. Saw this person looking around at the front and eventually went over and said, can I help you? Do you want to talk to anybody? And they were after a Bible because they'd seen the Noah movie on the TV or somewhere, on the video, and were really shocked by it. Now, I've not seen the Noah movie and don't intend to see it because it's not a true... It doesn't render the biblical story properly at all. But it affected this person enough to come in and looking for a Bible. I won't tell you the rest of the story, it's not for public ears, but I was just a bit confused about the gender of this person, and I still am. But at least they came in looking for a Bible, and I was able to give them one because they had no money. I found it one they could have. And I showed them where the Noah story was, but I know they're going to be very disappointed if they're looking for what they saw on the, on the movie. But my point is that all sorts of people come, and I was able to gift that person. I don't know whether it's a male or a woman yet, Though she said her name was Donna, but uh, I was able to give her a Bible and, and bless her. Hallelujah. Jesus says, I see your works, what you've done for others. And so it's not just our individual works either, it's what we do as Shiloh. Amen. So on um, Thursday, Shiloh was able to send $450 to, to one of our brothers who's involved in a big work and, and, and is transiting, transitioning through something right now. We're able to send $600 to, the, to a brother in India to help with flood, flood relief among the churches. That, that sort of thing happens every week here at Shiloh. We're always sending money into developing countries to help people or to help them with the mission. Amen? So God sees all of those works. We, we wished we could keep you even all better informed on that without boasting about it or without, you know, because you have a right to know in a sense because you're Shiloh. But Shiloh does a lot of works that, that, are, that are also in secret. In, in July this year we hosted 10 international brethren here in Toowoomba for four weeks and hardly anyone else in Toowoomba knew about it because we just felt to keep it quiet. But that was a great work, Amen. And so Jesus says, I know your works. There's nothing we, you do individually or we do as Shiloh that Jesus doesn't know. And guess what? He's not unhappy with us. Amen? I think he's fairly happy with us. He told me many years ago he liked Shiloh and he hasn't told me he's changed his mind. <laughs> and, and you know, when we're preparing for this last season of feasts and I was seeking the Lord early one morning, half awake, half asleep, Lord, you know, how do we do it? What do you want us to do? And you know what he said? He said, Paul, you just do, do whatever you plan and I'll show up. And who, who of you who are local and been in some of the celebrations have known that Jesus turned up quite significantly? In fact, one of our videos of the blowing a trumpet's night, which was more like a party than anything else, went out and, and, and we have a sister here today who, who heard it and started to cry. It so much affected her spirit. And then she shouted in her house church meeting and all the brethren there enjoyed it as well. Hallelujah, because God showed up. We, we planned something to honour God and he said, Paul, you just plan basically whatever you like and I'll be there. So I had a total confidence that whatever we came up with to do, God would be there and he's been there. Hallelujah. So he's enriched our lives. Okay. So he says, back to our text, C. C simply means call attention to. Behold. It's translated mostly in the, new, in the old King James as the word behold. Sort of a bit stronger than C, isn't it? Behold! I have set an open door before you. And set really comes from a word that simply means give. So I've given you an open door. Behold! I've given you 
an open door. Isn't that awesome? God is speaking in the first tense. He's calling our attention to the fact that he set before us an open door. I mean, after lunch, we're going to do some sort of a workshop. We were thinking of a round table. We may do it in small groups. And one of the questions I want you to discuss is, or, or to share with each other is, can you see that open door? Is that real in your life, in your perspective? Do you see an open door in front of you? Or, or is it shut for you still? Jesus said, Behold, I've set before you, or I've given you, an open door. And no one can shut it. Hallelujah. So let's just look at this door for a moment. John, John chapter 10 verse 9 says that the door is this door here. So if you write John 10 verse 9 there. And if you come in that door, Jesus said, you'll be saved. Isn't that awesome? John 10, Jesus said, I am the door. So Jesus is the door. And this is the door here, the door into salvation. Amen. So Jesus said, if you come in that door, you'll be saved. He says, anyone who tries to come in at this point, or at this point, or at that point, what are they? They're robbers and thieves. And you know, without meaning to be, many church people and pastors are robbers and thieves because they try to do church without coming the way. The way is through the door. The door of believing in Jesus, the suffering lamb, and being baptised into him. That's the only door. But there's many even in Pentecostal churches that have been baptised. Some now don't speak in tongues anymore. Never spoken in tongues, but they go to a Pentecostal, I'm Pentecostal brother, whatever that means. There's only one door and we've got to, and then that's the way, amen? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So that's the door. But let's look at um, Acts 14.27. Paul is reporting back to the church at Antioch after his first missionary journey. And he says, Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he'd opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So either it's a door of faith, it's the door that leads to salvation, it's Jesus himself, and Paul calls it in Acts 13, what was it, 27? Acts 14, 27. It's a door of faith. Hallelujah. So Jesus said, I've set before you an open door, you're all saved? Of course you are, because you've been through that door. And it's a door of faith, it's a door that leads to salvation. Believe and be baptised, you'll be saved. Let's look at a verse in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 9. Paul writes to the Corinthians and says in verse 8, but I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. Why? For a great and effective door has opened to me and there are, Debbie, many adversaries. So, this is where we are. Wanting to ex be exploded in God's glory. Who feels like that? You just want to be released from all the junk. And see, that's, this is the fire here. So it's time for the fire. Remember, this one's water. This one's the spirit. But this doorway is fire. It's the day of atonement. It's, it's pushing through the veil. So push, which means pray until something happens. Okay? But there's a contending going on. There's a contending up in Arakoon just over the fact that folks there are being, are being baptised. And Rob's preach, preaching and teaching the word every day. So there's a contending. It, 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 it erupts in violence. It erupts in domestic violence. It erupts in street violence between different clansmen. Why? Because there's a contending even back here about people getting baptised. Two elders got baptised the other Sunday. But what's the contending that you're facing? It, it may be just something in your own personality that still rises up in you and you can't control it. And so there's a contending. It's actually an evil spirit and we need to get rid of those evil spirits. 
There's a contending for, by principalities and powers because as soon as the church enters into this realm, then the principalities and powers become losers. They already are losers officially. You know, their title is, I'm the principality of such a, I'm a loser. Because Jesus has already defeated me back at the cross, but I'm pretending because Satan has deceived me that I'm still the, still the big ruler here. But as soon as the church starts to come into this realm of glory and, and understanding the mystery, then the principalities and powers have to bow the knee and confess that Jesus the Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So there's a great contending here. Amen? But Jesus says, I've opened a door for you. So the door begins with salvation. The next door is to be filled with the Holy Spirit and enter into this life in the Spirit, which is awesome. Full of ups and downs, but it's awesome. Amen? Because the Spirit, he knows all things. He starts, he just at the right time, and sometimes when you least expect it, brings something up in your life that you have to face and deal with to break through into a fuller life in the Spirit. But then, as you grow up in the Spirit and get rid of some of your things that hold you back, then you start to grow in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. And you start realising that this, this walk to maturity is not impossible, even for little old me. Hallelujah. That we actually can all start to make progress in becoming mature in our understanding, mature in our behaviour. No longer just reacting and getting angry with people. Amen? So, we're pushing through, we're contending to come into this, through this door. And Paul says, for him it was a door, of an effective door. Folks, for me, I have an effective door open to me. I can preach and teach the word 24 hours a day if I was up to it. There's always people waiting on, on, on the email or waiting on the Facebook who want me to respond to them. So I have no... And, and, We'll talk about it later. But, but the fact, there's an effective door open to us. Do you know the last four Wednesdays, last Wednesday we preached in, 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 in Bogota, Colombia, from Alberto's lounge room. Can you imagine that? For an hour and a half. We shared the apostolic teaching. The week before, for nearly an hour and a half, we shared with some apostles and, and other brethren in, in, in Peru. And the week before in Peru again with the same group. But the week before that it was with a group in Santa Marta. And there's also a phone link to some brethren in Caracas, Caracas is it? the capital of Venezuela. So for the last four weeks we've been ministering in South America from his lounge room. You see, there's no, there's no limit on the door. The door is opened. The door on cyberspace is open to RMA. We, we have access anywhere we want to go. If, if we could just make friends with some good French speakers, we could start getting lots of French materials up. You know, let's do it. Mm. The door is open. And, and locally, the door is open. You know, we could find ourselves meeting every day and every night if we, if we allowed ourselves to do it. But we've just got to limit it a little bit, have a night off occasionally, even if it's just to catch up on the computer what's happening there. But an effective door has opened. But there are many adversaries. There's some even locally who want to stop us. Who, who don't accept. Who won't dare call me Apostle Paul Galligan. Still got to be pastor. Because they're scared if they call me Apostle that might make them uncomfortable. And it does. So they don't. <laughs> it's interesting. I don't care for titles, I care for truth. Amen. Many years ago I was still calling myself Pastor Paul Gulling and Jesus said, you're a liar. I said, excuse me? He said, you're a liar. I said, why am I a liar? He said, because I've appointed you to be an apostle and you're still telling everyone you're a pastor. Stop doing it. So I did. Hallelujah. Amen. So Jesus says, uh, Paul says, I'm going to stay in Ephesus. I want to stay in Ephesus at least for a little bit longer. Because an effective door is open to me. So, so let's look in Acts 19, verses 9 to 10, to just understand a little bit about that door that had opened in Ephesus for Paul. He says, But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples from the synagogue, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. He went into a public building. And this continued for two years, 
so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. What a door. No wonder Paul wanted to hang out in Ephesus a bit longer because he was seeing the fruit of the ministry reaching a whole province of Rome, which was called Asia, around Ephesus. Ephesus was the capital city of that province. Isn't that amazing? So no wonder he didn't want to rush somewhere else. He wanted to stay there. Let's look at another scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. Chapter 2 verse 12 of 2 Corinthians. Paul says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord. So Paul is talking here about a door opening in the town of Troas for him to preach the gospel of Christ. But it's interesting because he said, you know, I didn't stay there long because I was too concerned for my brother Titus. So so he went to another city to find Titus. Mm. So that surprises me that Paul would put the welfare of his brother above preaching the gospel where God had opened a door for him. So isn't that interesting? So Paul put great value on his relationships with, with the brothers that were working with him in the Lord and that he'd raised his sons. Hallelujah, isn't that beautiful? Mm. But we, we know that he did preach effectively in Troas as well at some point. Okay. In Colossians 4 verse 3, this is, a, this is the last one under this little heading. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 3. We're talking about the door. Jesus said, I set before you an open door. It's the door of salvation. It's the door of faith. It's the door of effective ministry. Amen? And in this one he says, Meanwhile, praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word. Or in the King James it says a door of Utterance. I like the old version. A door of utterance. That God would open for us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I'm also in chains. So what's the door that Paul is asking for us to pray for? A door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ. And he says, I'm even in prison chains because of because of this calling. But even as a prisoner, I still want the door to open so I can speak boldly, so I can give utterance to the word, the mystery of Christ. Isn't that awesome? So what's the door? It's the door of salvation. It's the door of faith. It's the door to preach the gospel. It's the door of utterance of the mystery. It's the door for effective ministry, to reach a whole region, a whole province with the word. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And one more, Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, John says, a door was open in heaven. So John was in the spirit, having a while of a time. That's a funny saying, isn't it? I guess that means he's having a huge time, a really wonderful, big experience. And there's even more. As the Toyota salesman says, then there's more. I'm not the Toyota man, who is it? One used to sell the knives on the TV. And there's more. Because God then opened a door into heaven. John's in the spirit, but now he can enter right into heaven itself. And what happens when he enters that door? He hears a voice like a trumpet. So he hears the trumpet. He hears a prophetic proclamation. And what else happens? The voice says, come up here. So the prophetic voice says, the trumpet says, Come up, come up, come up here church, into the realm of heaven. Not just into the realm of the spirit, but even in the very realm of heaven. This is the realm of heaven here. This is the realm of the spirit here. See John, John out here was in the midst of the seven, two, three, four, five, six, seven churches. That's where he saw Jesus in the first three chapters of Revelation. So he's in the spirit he said on the Lord's day, are you with me? But now God's voice says, come up here into heaven. Into the realm of heaven. This is the third realm where God dwells. Oh, come on. Are you getting this? John started off here in Revelation chapter 1. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I saw the Lord in the midst of the churches. 
This is the this is the realm of the sanctuary. But this is the holy of holies. And then after he's met with Jesus in, in the in the sanctuary, then he sees a door opened into heaven. And he hears the voice as a trumpet saying, Come up here. Come up here. And where's it gone to? Come up here. He was immediately in the spirit and he saw the throne. He saw the throne. Because the throne is in here. The throne's not out there. The throne's in this realm. Hallelujah. See, people out in this realm, they just want to go to heaven. So they believe when they die, they'll go to heaven. That's true. And if, and if Jesus comes in a rapture that some of them hope for, he'll take them straight to heaven. <laughs> but see, God doesn't want you waiting out here to go to heaven. He wants you coming in here into heaven. Oh, come, come up here. The door is opened. The trumpet is blowing. Yes. Come up here and you'll see the throne. You don't have to die back here and go to heaven to see the throne. Not even sure whether you'll see it then. But you'll see it here. Yes. Push in. Yes. Come up here. Yes. Hallelujah. Some of you are a bit stunned, are you? No. Hallelujah. So Jesus said in Revelation 3 verse 8 to us, no one can shut it. The door is open. Which door? The door of salvation. The door of faith. The door of ministry. That's in this realm here. Utterance of the mystery. To prepare the church to come up here. But the final door is the door into heaven. We, we had a chap in our house meetings up at Burham last week. He's a big tall man, about six foot five. And he wears a big beard and long hair. And he's a big man. And when he gets excited, he just gets up and does a bit of a dance. We need him here today <laughs> to do his dance. Back to Revelation 3 verse 8. Jesus said, I've opened this door for you because of three reasons. He says you have a little strength, you've kept my word, and you have not denied my name. So let the Lord vindicate us, but over the years we've had a little strength. Not a big strength. None of us has ever been really strong in ministry. And, you know, we're just small in number, generally. We're not financially flush but we always have enough occasionally we get a flush and we give it all away sell it into ministries hallelujah but Jesus says because you have a little strength that strength comes from him Jesus says because you've kept my word well let the Lord vindicate us but I believe we've faithfully taught his word here and that many have heard that word and have kept it Hallelujah. And we've not denied his name. Again, let the Lord be our vindication, but he's revealed his name to us in deeper and deeper realms. I remember way back at the beginning in 1998, having a little teaching meeting with about five people out at the Blake Street Centre on the west side of Toowoomba here. There was a little RMA meeting, and I was teaching them on the Hebrew names. So I read up on the board, Yahweh, Elohim, Shaddai, Names like that and we, were get, we just got blessed. We got anointed. And so for the 16, nearly 17 years of this ministry we've been discovering his name and keeping his name. Revering his name. And so for those three reasons that we have a little strength that comes from God. We've kept his word by his grace and we've not denied his name. In fact we've gone and preached his name all over the world and sent it out in manuals. God says... The one who holds the key of David, who shuts and no one can open, who opens and no one can He said, see, I've set before you an open door. Amen? I've set before you an open door. I wonder how many of you can actually remember 
the first time you came into personal contact with us, with RMA, and the, co- and the impact it had on you. In, in the small groups after lunch, I want you to share some of that. Just, just to, you know, we're going to introduce our sister more tomorrow and, and pray with her, the new sister down here from Gladstone, but you know, she, she's already got a testimony walking into Shiloh yesterday. She'll share it in the small group this hour. So you've entered into Shiloh and Jesus says, as part of Shiloh, there's a door open before you. No man can shut it. Amen? If you'll keep, if you'll realise that your strength comes from me, if you will keep my word, which you've heard now, and not deny my name, then you can go through that door. That door can never shut. You, you can think it's shut if you start trying to act in your own strength. You can think it's shut when you stop keeping his word. You can think it's shut when you stop when you start denying his name, that he really is the, the great king, the anointed one who can do everything and has everything. Yes, you'll think the door is shut. But if you remain in that humble position of knowing that we have a little strength given to us by God, knowing that he's given us and entrusted us with his word, and knowing that he's revealed his name to us, we will succeed. Not judged by outward success, but judged by faithfulness and obedience. We could say a lot more about what is that door, but let's do that in small groups, maybe after lunch. Just pushing on to finish this letter in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, and we're up to verse 9. Indeed, I'll make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie, indeed I'll make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Now I've not given a lot of thought to that verse, but it's a very powerful verse, isn't it? It's not that we're going to be worshipped, literally, but what is it really saying? That those who oppose us, even officially, in the name of God, and say, well, you're not really part of the church in Toowoomba because you never come to anything. You guys are just on the side there at Shiloh. No, that's wrong. And the day will come when they will, they will come and bow down and acknowledge that Jesus is with us, that he's loved us, and that we're being obedient to his calling. You know, we're not trying to do anything else here. We're not some elitist or exclusive group at all. Everybody is welcome. But don't bring the devil in here with you because then you'll feel unwelcome. You don't don't come in here with some other doctrine but come in here willing to to read the word of God and receive it as it is written. But anyway, we'll leave that one. Next one is verse 10. Because you've kept my command to persevere. So who's persevering? Who's willing to persevere? Jesus actually says he's commanded us to persevere. That means you don't give up when the going gets tough. You don't complain, you don't gossip, you don't murmur. You had someone recently almost trying to justify gossip to me. I said, excuse me, that's gossip and gossip is what? It's condemned in the Bible strongly. But, But if you keep my commandment to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So do you think Ebola might be a test? Do you think ISIL, so-called, might be a test? Yeah. So how are you handling that test? Are you coming under it and getting worried and talking about negative things? Or are you proclaiming the victory? Are you persevering in the truth? Are you continuing in the word? Recently I was in a a house meeting and we were just finishing off our cup of tea and we hadn't quite started the meeting as such. But you know, even before I started the meeting, I I just stopped the conversation. I said, well brothers, we're really here to worship Jesus and consider the word of God. So let's stop talking about these negative things in a negative way. It's not befitting for us. Amen? I was becoming a little bit overwhelmed and at least annoyed by the conversation. 
because someone would say something negative and someone else would say something negative. And, then it's a, and we had about three or four of us involved in a negative conversation. What's the point of that? Well, the devil's saying, that's a very good point in that, Paul. That's how, I, that's how I discourage you. That's how I take over the church. I just get you all murmuring against God and, and fearing what the devil's doing on the earth. And hallelujah, got the victory again. Praise God for the victory for the devil. <laughs> Amen? Now, we don't actually say that, but we fall into that trap often where we become murmurers, complainers, gossipers, and the devil's saying, hmm, very good. Hallelujah, more of it, Lord. Hmm. So, but Jesus says, I'll keep you from the hour of trial. Yes, great tests are coming on the earth, even, even currently. Ebola and ISIL. How are you handling the test? Are you letting the Lord keep you? Hide you away? Could show you more about that. Haven't got time. And then he says in verse 11, Behold, I'm coming quickly. If you've got the Spiritual Life Bible, come over to chapter 22, verse 20 of Revelation. There's a word worth on the word quickly. It's a pretty, pretty amazing word. You know what it means? Quickly. Immediately. Speedily. Shortly. Hastily. And in the book of Revelation, it is especially used in relation to the imminent return of Christ. So he, wants, he says he's going to come quickly. He says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Many of us don't even know we've got a crown. But Jesus says you've got a crown. So you better start wearing it and not letting anyone take it off you. Amen? You've got a crown. When you go down to the coffee shop, on mission, you're, you're wearing a crown. When you go shopping even, you're wearing a crown. Don't forget. Don't become of the world just because you've got to go shopping. Don't become of the world just because you get caught in a, you know, a bit of traffic in Toowoomba. Yeah, Toowoomba traffic is not very grievous really. So we, don't take your crown off when you're driving your car. Amen? Don't let anyone steal that crown from you. Don't let them make you impatient. Don't... don't you know, if watching videos about ISIL gets you all negative and stirred up, stop doing it. Watch a video about Jesus and get built up and victorious. I mean, there's a thin line, you know. Good, well-meaning saints want to send all this stuff out about ISIL and, you know, about women being raped and stoned to death and, yeah, that's terrible. But, but what, what's Jesus doing? What's he saying about this? Why is he allowing it to happen? And finally, verse 12. He who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. I'll just give you two references to follow up. 1 Timothy 3.15. Okay? I've got two minutes left, have I? No, no, no. Yep. Yep. So, 1 Timothy 3.15. Paul's writing to Timothy, who's, who's an apostle, functioning separately to Paul now, but Paul still feels the need to write to him saying, Timothy, I'm writing to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So Jesus said, if you, if you overcome, I'll make you a pillar in the temple of my God and you'll go out no more. So what's the pillar? It's the truth that God was manifested in the flesh. That God became incarnate. That God took on flesh. That, that the word became flesh and lived among us. That's the pillar of truth. That's what we forget about when we start worrying about the Muslims, when we start worrying about the homosexuals, when we start worrying about President Obama, who's now convinced that he can get every state to pass same-sex marriage laws because the Constitution requires it. That's his latest take. Well, who cares about Obama? If the Americans let that happen, woe to the Americans. Americans, stand up for righteousness. Get off your backsides. You're supposed to be the most Christianised nation on the earth. How about we see it? Amen? Don't feel sorry for America. Get stuck into the Christians and tell them to get up, speak up. 
go to jail for their beliefs. Come on. Amen. Who cares if the, the mayor of Houston wants all the pastors to send their sermon notes into him? Send them in, pastors. Tell him the truth. Come on. Let every bureaucrat in the city read your post sermons. You've got a bigger congregation immediately. Come on. Let's do it. Oh, isn't it terrible? No, it's not terrible. It's good. They must be speaking the truth. That the lesbian mayor is concerned about what they're saying about her. Come on. Lesbian mayor of Houston, stand down in the name of Jesus. So that's what it means to make you a pillar. Jesus wants to make you a pillar in the house of God. Hello. Who's willing to be a pillar? To stand up for the truth. Amen. And the other reference is, is Genesis chapter um, 28 verse 18 to 22. You know, that, that, that stone that, that Jacob rested on and got that awesome dream, you know what he did next morning? He stood it up and he anointed it with oil and said, this is a pillar in the house of God. Who? Oh, so what, what's a pillar in the house of God? A revelation of the eternal one becoming flesh. That God is able to speak to a man on the earth and show him the vision for his life and show him the vision of the future for his sons. And then Jesus said, you'll, when you're a pillar, when you have this truth, you go out no more. And then he says, I'll write on you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down. Hallelujah. Out of heaven from my God and my new name. So much beautiful revelation in all of that to come. And then he says, that him who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So the Spirit's in here speaking to the church. Amen? And we need to hear so that we can Become a pillar in the house of God. God bless you. It's just been awesome. God has set before us here at RMA, at Shiloh, Australia, but Shiloh Apostolic Company worldwide, brethren, God has set before us an open door. No man can shut it. Continue to persevere. Use the strength that God gives you to do his work. Keep his word and preach it faithfully, teach it faithfully, and lift up his name. Amen.